Hi everybody, I'm Jack, the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you are doing well. I hope you're having a good week. Uh, I've been pretty busy, but I did manage to find time to attend a party with Virginia Woolf at the Dalloways. And it was amazing. Uh, Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf is just an incredible book. It is, you know, it's not just a perfect example of literary modernism, first published in 1925. It's, it's an example of a perfect novel, of, of a, what a great work of fiction can do for a reader. It's exquisitely written. The language is, is beautiful. And there are, there are not just sentences, but whole passages where it feels like Wolf is treating each word as a sort of polished gem that she's putting together in this larger work, a diadem, that she doesn't ju just want us to, you know, glance at, see, and then move along, but to really spend time with and examine and peruse. And uh, she wants our attention as readers, and so she's putting in her intention as a writer. And it's, it's wonderful. Uh, the, the book is also, you know, it's very fluid as a reading experience. And I think that's an important piece because it can feel inaccessible as many modernist novels do. It can feel inaccessible because we sort of zip from one character's mind to another's throughout the book, often without warning, like from sentence to sentence. Um, and then we'll spend a few pages with that character and then we'll drift back, you know, off to some new one. But those transitions from one character to another are very seamless. Um, it's kind of like you know you're with a good driver or a good pilot when you know the car turns or the plane changes altitude and not everybody's thrown into their seat <laughs> what's this and wolf gives us that you know she gives us different experiences but she allows us to navigate the changes uh without jarring our minds too much um it, but the sense of characters is also so critical in mrs dalloway i think not just in modernist novels but a lot of a lot of writers Sometimes reading their works can feel a little bit like looking at an aquarium. You know, we see really cool colors and interesting things there and really pretty fish, but everything is constricted. Uh, whether it's because of the plot um, and, and sort of the, the needs of the plot or uh, because of some theme that the writer really wants to like point us towards and hammer us towards and so everything has to bend in that direction. Um, but it can feel a little bit like, you know, you're just looking at an aquarium, a very pretty one, albeit. But with Mrs. Dalloway, the characters feel free. Their lives feel uh, free. Now, they're tethered to their memories. They're tethered to their experiences. They're tethered to their past. But they feel like they have free lives that extend. They extend outside of the confines of this book, um, as, you know, our lives do. And, and that's, uh, that, that is maybe one of the great strengths of the book, is just how free, not just the languages, but how free the characters can feel. And so very briefly, you know, what's going on? Well, it, all of the action, you know, within the plot of the novel takes place within, within the same day. It's not really a full 24 hour day. Uh, we pick up, you know, as, as the day has started and Clarissa Dalloway is going to throw a party. This is something she does frequently. Um, she's, you know, very conscious of wanting to throw a good party. She has a friend, uh, Peter, who she hasn't seen in a while. He's come back from India, back to England. And so, She's, you know, sort of reconnect, going to reconnect with him. Um, she's thinking about another friend from her youth, Sally, who she hasn't seen in a while. And so this is, you know, this is how we open. We go through that day as, you know, plans for the party take place. Different people rekindle connections or realize how, how much uh, those connections have frayed and ultimately, you know, just become lost. And uh, we end at Mrs. Dalloway's party that evening. And so that's the whole action of the novel. But what Wolf is going to create for us is this sense of what is life like going about one's day. This feels like sort of a regular day for middle class, upper middle class individuals. And what Wolf is going to show us is that as we go about our day, all of these little events that occur, um, whether it's something we see, something we hear, uh, whether it's someone we see, causes us to drip, you know, to slip out of out of the present and into some aspect of our past, into the memories that we truly are tethered to, the memories that really anchor us in a sense, for better or worse, uh, and and that's what Wolf is showing us. And sometimes it's it's really incredible where there's there's one memorable passage where a character is basically adjusting his shoe, and so we drift into his mind as he starts this adjustment on his shoe, and then Wolf brings us back because, oh, something new is happening with his shoe in the present. And then his mind drifts again for a paragraph, and then he's back, and, you know, finally it's, it's closed up. He's adjusted his shoe. He's carrying on about his day. But in that moment, we have, the, we have these bits where he, you know, time warps 
back into the past. And so sometimes it's very brief. Sometimes it's an extended, you know, memory of a couple of pages uh, that, that just shows the significance of all of these little experiences that come, you know, to comprise each of us and each of our lives. Uh, and so it, it's really wonderful. I do want to read, you know, a passage that kind of gives an, a sense of that. So we're in uh, Clarissa Dalloway's mind. Uh, she, but she could remember going cold with excitement and doing her hair in a kind of ecstasy. Now the old feeling began to come back to her as she took out her hairpins, laid them on the dressing table, began to do her hair. So I had a memory. Now I'm, she's doing her hair, but now that memory continues with the rooks flaunting up and down in the pink evening light and dressing and going downstairs and feeling as she crossed the hall. If it were now to die, it were now to be most happy. That was her feeling, Othello's feeling. And she felt it, she was convinced, as strongly as Shakespeare meant Othello to feel it. All because she was coming down to dinner in a white frock to meet Sally Seton. She was wearing pink gauze. Was that possible? She seemed, anyhow, all light, glowing like some bird or air ball that has flown in, attached itself for a moment to a bramble. But nothing is so strange when one is in love. And what was this except being in love? As the complete indifference of other people. And so we have these, you know, little, not even full sentences, but these little clauses that drift us, you know, in and out of the past and present as Mrs. Dalloway is just fixing her hair. Uh, and, and again, the language is just glorious. I can picture that whole scene. Um, and so th that sense of, of, you know, of memory is really critical for the characters. And what's interesting is the way Wolf shows us how you know, there's a couple of different characters who have memories about basically the same summer vacation and how each of them felt that that was a really, really important summer vacation in their sort of late adolescence. And as adults, decades later, they're still thinking about it. They, it still, you know, sort of comes back. And does it haunt them? Does it empower them? What does it do? Well, we have another passage. Clarissa once, this is another character thinking about a memory of Clarissa Dalloway. Clarissa once, going on top of an omnibus with him somewhere, Clarissa, superficially at least, so easily moved, now in despair, now in the best of spirits, all a quiver in those days, in such good company, spotting queer little scenes, names, people from the top of a bus, for they used to explore London and bring back bags full of treasures from the Caledonian market. Clarissa had a theory in those days. They had heaps of theories, always theories, as young people have. It was to explain the feeling they had of dissatisfaction. Not knowing people, not being known. For how could they know each other? You met every day. Then not for six months or years. It was unsatisfactory, they agreed, how little one knew people. But she said, sitting on the bus, going up Shaftesbury Avenue, she felt herself everywhere. Not here, here, here. And she tapped the back of the seat, but everywhere. She waved her hand going up Shaftesbury Avenue. She was all that. So that to know her or anyone, one must seek out the people who completed them, even the places. Odd affinities she had with people she had never spoken to, some woman in the street, some man behind a counter, even trees or barns. It ended, ended in a transcendental theory, which, with her horror of death, allowed her to believe, or say that she believed, for all her skepticism, that since our apparitions, the part of us which appears, are so momentary compared with the other, the unseen part of us, which spreads wide, the unseen might survive, be recovered somehow, attached to this person or that, or even haunting certain places after death. Perhaps, perhaps. Looking back over that long friendship of almost 30 years, her theory worked to this extent. Brief, broken, almost often painful as their actual meetings had been, what with his absences and interruptions, this morning, for instance, in came Elizabeth, like a long-legged colt, handsome, dumb, just as he was beginning to talk to Clarissa. The effect of them on his life was immeasurable. There was a mystery about it. You were given a sharp, acute, uncomfortable grain. The actual meeting, horribly painful as often as not. Yet in absence, in the most unlikely places, it would flower out, open, shed its scent, let you touch, taste, look about you, get the whole feel of it and understanding after years of lying lost. You know, she had influenced him more than any person he had ever known. Uh, and always in this way, coming before him without his wishing it, cool, ladylike, critical, or ravishing, romantic, recalling some field or English harvest. He saw her most often in the country, not in London, one scene after another at Borden. He had reached his hotel. He crossed the hall with its mouth. You know, and so we have this incredible memory of not just, you know, the, a character remembering Clarissa Dalloway, but remembering all of her ideas 
and then applying them and reflecting on those ideas from a, another character had across his whole you know experience and his relationship with Clarissa and it, it's just such a wonderful example of how you know we, we have characters who are thinking in a book not just you know doing and like they did this and then they did this and then they went here but actually thinking as characters and trying to reconcile their minds and their identities and their past with what is happening here in the present and why they feel this way as it happens and so it really is an amazing book i highly highly recommend it now there is um an interesting uh parallel that wolf identified uh even like in her letters this is volume three from when she was writing uh, Mrs. Dalloway. In her letters, Wolf was very clear with like her friends and you know readers she had for the book that uh, the character of Septimus Smith was important as almost a sort of double, a, a, a doubling of Mrs. Dalloway. And he is a character who is a World War I veteran who has um, uh, PTSD and it is basically he has become, as the other characters are all sort of anchored with these memories, good or bad, he has become almost unmoored from from the memories that uh, he would have, and so we see this this really haunting um, final day in his life, uh, and and he does ultimately die by suicide. But his his experiences, you know, as the character within the book, uh, are deeply haunting. They they remind me a lot of Quentin Compson in uh, the Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner, although Faulkner published that wrote that after Mrs. Dalloway. Um, but they, they, they're a little, a little bit like that um, in, when we're in his mind. And they're, they're frankly terrifying. We see all of these other characters who m feel unhappy in their lives, but ultimately make a go of it. And then we see a character who, who just almost, feel, it's, it's not as if he's in the same reality as all of the others, uh, as he's experiencing you know, PTSD and, and the horror um, of war and, and the toll it has had on his life. And so... That's a really important aspect to the book that uh, I don't know in this reading, I was paying enough attention to it. I'll have to pay more attention to that on a future reading. Um, but this is, is really, really an amazing book. Um, in comparison, you know, I think, uh, I think Wolf is really good about building these really thoughtful, intelligent characters, and particularly, you know, in Clarissa Dalloway, a thoughtful and intelligent uh, woman, in a way that advances, uh, you know, A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen, or even in a way that takes uh, some of Jane Austen's characters. I was thinking more spe most specifically of Persuasion, I think, where the, the lives feel a little more real. They feel like they've, you know, had, as the one character said, they've, they've had grains of sand rubbed against them to sort of, you know, scar and, and smooth certain areas, but also scar some certain areas. Uh, and so those, those were two that came to mind. Obviously, in terms of modernism, uh, Sound and Fury by William Faulkner, not just Quentin Compson, but the whole Quentin Compson section where there's, he's always asking about the time. Well, throughout Mrs. Dalloway, one of the devices uh, Wolf uses is to have Big Ben tolling throughout the book so that we know kind of, wait, which character are we with? We're, we're resetting Big Ben is tolling. Now we know what time of day it is. We can, we, we keep, she keeps grounding us in reality even as we slip back into the past with her characters. Uh, but The Sound and the Fury, of course, feels um, of a piece with it. Uh, Catherine Mansfield's stories, I find these much closer to the writing of D.H. Lawrence, but the story Bliss in particular uh, reminds me somewhat of Mrs. Dalloway. Um, and then two fellow modernists, I find Mrs. Dalloway so much more accessible and so much more fun <laughs> and so much more authentic, I want to say, uh, non-artificial. Uh, non-contrived than Ulysses by James Joyce and even um, you know In Search of Lost Time uh, by Marcel Proust Swan's Way being the first volume in part I think because Wolf is not necessarily creating a highly autobiographical autobiographical character and uh, in Clarissa Dalloway you know she is not Clarissa Dalloway even though she perhaps puts aspects of herself into the different characters she's not that way uh, the way that Proust and Joyce are in their books Henry Green's Party Going was written about 10, 12 years later and feels of a piece with it. Um, Ford Maddox Ford's Parades End might be my way into understanding Septimus Smith better. And then Redshift by Alan Garner does some weird time jumps as well. But this was Miss Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. And I was, re I was inspired to read this because uh, Margaret was uh, doing her March of the Moderns challenge. So I love modernist lit. 
Uh, let me know if you've read this book, if you have other Virginia Woolf books you prefer. Uh, the Waves feels like it takes Mrs. Dalloway exponentially in that direction. Uh, Between the Acts feels a little more structurally contrived. So uh, let me know what you think. Thanks, everybody.